Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in for, for, for sticking around. My name is Thomas Dodman and I teach here in the history department. Um, it is my duty to uh, remind you to turn off your cell phones and to pick up your shovels um, as you leave and afterwards. You may very well need them. Um, it is also my, my great, um, somewhat humbling pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker uh, this afternoon. Jonathan Israel is the Andrew Mellon Professor in the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He obtained his doctorate at Oxford and, before moving to the US in 2001, was Professor of Dutch History and Institutions at University College London, an institution that is very dear to me because um, that is where I was an undergraduate too, um, although uh, a rather clueless one because I did not take any classes with uh, Professor Israel while he was still there. A recipient of numerous prizes and fellowships from the British Academy, the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Historical Association, only to name a few, Jonathan Israel is the author of a dozen books and countless more articles and contributions in what must surely rank as one of the most prodigious scholarly outputs among contemporary historians. His earlier works include classics such as European Jewry in the Age of Mercantilism, 1550 to 1750, published by Oxford University Press in 1985, the Dutch Republic, Its Rise, Greatness, and Fall, 1477 to 1806, uh, published in 1995, and to many still, Israel's finest work. These dealt in the economic, in economic and imperial history, looking at the transatlantic connections between the Dutch Republic, the Spanish Empire from which it emerged, and the er an early modern Jewish community. Israel's move across the Atlantic in the early 2000s coincided with the turn to a second major research agenda, and not just any odd one, a radical and comprehensive reinterpretation of the Enlightenment. Such a daunting task, overtaken moreover um, at a time when uh, postmodernism had um, sort of uh, continued its onslaught against the Enlightenment, called for extraordinary measures. And the ensuing 3,000 page long trilogy, that's not a typo, 3,000 page long trilogy, Israel set about rethinking the origins, scope, and impact of the intellectual, this intellectual movement, deploying the immense erudition, trenchant analysis and um, provocative claims that have become his trademark. With Radical Enlightenment, Philosophy and the Making of Modernity, 1650 to 1750, published by Oxford um, in 2001, he offered a sweeping revision of the origins of the Enlightenment, extending conventional chronologies and geographies to 17th century Netherlands, the so-called scientific revolution, and the pivotal, and especially the pivotal figure of Barak Spinoza. This daring new intellectual movement, he claimed, promoted a materialist, atheistic, and monistic philosophy that did not only challenge reigning dualistic metaphysics, but also social and political hierarchies, paving the way to an egalitarian ethics and democratic politics. In both this book and its follow-up, Enlightenment Contested, Philosophy, Modernity, and the Emancipation of Man, 1670 to 1752, published in 2006, Israel traced the wavering fortunes of these radical philosophes and their more moderate peers, among whom he controversially placed the likes of John Locke, Voltaire, Immanuel Kant, and to a certain extent, Jean-Jacques Rousseau too. In the final installment of the trilogy, Democratic Enlightenment, Philosophy, Revolution, and Human Rights, 1750 to 1792, published in 2011, and which was preceded um, by uh, the 2008 Isaiah Berlin Lecture at Oxford University, which was itself published in 2009 as a revolution of the mind, radical enlightenment, and the intellectual origins of modern democracy. And I bring that up because um, it, is, um, it, it comes in at a modest 296 pages for those of you who um, are um, pressed for time. Israel took on with characteristic vigor the contentious task of connecting the ideas of the Enlightenment to the political revolutions of the late 18th century Atlantic. With his latest publication to date, Revolutionary Ideas, an intellectual history of the French Revolution from the Rights of Man to Robespierre, just published this past year, and which was awarded, I think, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Prose Award in European and World History, he has added a small 900-page coda to the trilogy, further unfolding the fraught trajectory of radical enlightenment through the French Revolution. Um, now, I'm going to let um, others, which are more adept at math, to calculate just how many more volumes and pages it would um, we, we can we can look forward to um, in order to continue to follow this red thread all the way up to the present. After all, the dialectic of enlightenment is of a rather long durée, as um, we know. Um, I'm going to be content with uh, simply pointing us sideways, perhaps, as it were, um, across the, the late 18th century Atlantic, um, and to the title of, of this afternoon's lecture, lecture, which is Thomas Jefferson and the French Revolution. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jonathan. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much for that uh, 
generous introduction uh, and profuse apologies for arriving late. It's, uh, we've been stuck in traffic jams and uh, held up in over the last half an hour, and I'm very sorry for that. That's really, really a, a pity. Um, and I want to indeed talk about Thomas Jefferson and the French Revolution, uh, but try to hold the French Revolution in a certain parallelism with the American Revolution. I think there's a lot to be learnt and a, a great deal to be appreciated about both the American Revolution and the French Revolution through uh, thinking about them together and in relation to the particular standpoint of Jefferson. Of course, Jefferson, chief author of the Declaration of Independence, was a voracious reader. He read a tremendous amount. He had an enormous library, much of it philosophical and much of it anti-religious. He was not, of course, uh, very friendly disposed towards theologians uh, or the clergy in general, and in particular felt that it was important to minimize the role of religious authority in politics. That is a continuous thread which we see right way through his political career and his intellectual development. Um, it's interesting, speaking about his intellectual development and his library, that uh, obviously he's thoroughly steeped in enlightenment. That's the number one thing. If one isn't thinking in terms of enlightenment, one isn't going to understand anything about Jefferson. He's a classic enlightenment figure of a particular type. And this uh, Republican, uh, somewhat uh, uh, hostile to religious authority, this Republican tendency, I would link quite closely to um, the radical enlightenment as I've tried to characterize it. That's to say, and I, I define radical enlightenment just so that you could be clear about that at the beginning of the lecture, as that part, I think all enlightenment, moderate and Radical Enlightenment was revolutionary in the sense that it wanted to use the new criteria of uh, reason and uh, of reform, reformism, to change many things. I think all Enlighteners were interested in changing the basic the structures of uh, law, authority, institutions, and politics in both on both sides of the Atlantic, in Europe as in America. But uh, those that uh, tended towards a democratic, republican standpoint and the more or less the complete elimination of religious authority and those two, the linkage between those two things, uh, eliminating religious authority and this uh, republican, this democratic republican tendency, as opposed to say John Adams who's republic, who's surely uh, also very much a Republican, but more in the classical Republican tradition, and more, uh, Jefferson would describe that as aristocratic Republicanism. Jefferson often uses the word aristocratic pejoratively, and also as a way of clearly distinguishing, putting distance between his kind of Republicanism and the sort of Republicanism we would associate with, for example, John Adams. So if you uh, rewrite the say, the Massachusetts State Constitution, as John Adams does in uh, 1780, uh, with a pretty limited suffrage and uh, with the design of leaving control of the political system within the, let's say, the more privileged elements in society, that would be the kind of republicanism that Jefferson wanted to distance himself from. Well. Uh, it's rather striking that he's not very keen on Rousseau, for instance, which so many uh, late 18th century figures are enthusiastic about. He doesn't seem to have much appreciation for Locke. And it's significant that uh, he doesn't, he seems to show even a marked dislike. I don't think that's too strong for Hume, Montesquieu, and Blackstone. So there are lots of likes and dislikes amongst his rather comprehensive reading in the Enlightenment. Um, certainly Jefferson made no claim to originality for the ideas infusing uh, the Declaration, 1776, uh, of independence, and uh, his, of course there are too few refer references to specific political ideas in that document to derive to any very strong conclusion just from that. But we can see more broadly from his correspondence, from his comments, uh, that certain uh, preferences that uh, deserve to be underlined. So while classical republicanism figured prominently in his early education and thinking, by 1776, I think we can safely say that he'd acquired a conception of human rights as uh, natural, primary, and above any human constitution, which he developed from uh, a distinctly radical philosophical standpoint. 
Well, in Virginia, his home state, in June 1776, we see uh, a declaration of rights that precedes the, uh, the uh, national, the federal declaration of rights. It's chiefly the work of one of the richest of the Virginia planters, George Mason, uh, a figure unusual for the strength of his strong ideological Republican commitment. And although uh, Declaration of Rights, the, the, the Virginia State Declaration of Rights of 1776 is perhaps not terribly unusual in itself, or a major innovation in itself, it certainly was highly innovative with respect to the terms in which it was composed. Uh, so it, ju it just precedes uh, Jefferson's Declaration, the, the, Jeff the, the, the National Declaration of Rights in 1776. Um, and uh, I think it can fairly be described as the world's first modern declaration of rights based on a conception of universal and equal rights. There's quite a lot of confusion, I think, in discussions about rights in the late 18th century because rights is a term used uh, a great deal in the late 17th and early 18th century, in Locke, for instance. And there's been a tendency, I think, to see universal and equal rights, which is the crucial breakthrough in the 1770s, as somehow derivative from earlier usages of rights. The very good recent book on this, by the way, Peter de Bola, The Structure, The Architecture of Concepts, I think is his title, uh, where he uses digital methods, quantitative methods, uh, analyzing different phrases to show, I think quite convincingly, that there's a big difference between early 18th century rights, which tends to be rather hierarchical. So, uh, let's say in an author like Locke, uh, kings have rights, aristocrats have rights, even slaves have rights, but there are rights at different levels. But that actually is a different kind of thinking as natural right in general in 17th and 18th century is from the discourse of universal and equal rights. This is something new, and I think rather revolutionary, much more radical, and you don't find it. That's the interesting thing about de Boer's uh, conclusions. Uh, he's only talking about the English-American context. He doesn't discuss France, and he's not looking at French texts. He's only looking at texts in English. But he emphasized, I think some scholars have noticed that there is a fairly sharp break around 1770 in usage of the term rights. But uh, de Bola, I think, lends added emphasis to this. So universal and equal rights, as it appears on the scene in the 1770s and 1780s, that's different, that's new, that's something very special. And that is not what is being talked about when uh, philosophers and jurists and others discuss rights in the 18th century. Um, now, uh, sorry to get my portraits on the screen. Um, so, Jefferson, I think, in the years around 1776, is doing something different and thinking in different terms from uh, how he'd been thinking at an earlier stage. Now, uh, of course, he was, played a very large part in uh, changes that were brought in by the State of Virginia Assembly at uh, the time that they were revising their constitution uh, and adding in the uh, Declaration of 1776. Uh, he wanted a wider suffrage. He was very keen on disestablishing the church. Uh, he um, was very keen on changes that were made to the laws of inheritance in order to uh, get rid of primogenitor primogeniture and other uh, legal uh, devices in Virginia which had helped maintain the largest estates. He, he called this uh, laying the axe to the root of pseudo-aristocracy. And uh, he, uh, although it didn't go as far as achieving universal male suffrage in Virginia, he, he was all for these changes, widening the suffrage and uh, leveling the aristocratic tendency uh, that uh, Virginia to a large extent, um, had characterized politics in Virginia down, down to the revolution. But in my lecture today, what I want to uh, focus attention on is his role as ambassador in France, 
um, from, he's in France from August 1784 to October 1789, and particularly the latter stages of this very interesting phase, because it seems to me that Jefferson uh, did rather more than one would normally expect of an ambassador. He became rather involved, and I think even deeply involved, in the politics of the revolution, and uh, uh, examining exactly who his friends were, what he was trying to achieve in the French Revolution, what his strategy in the French Revolution was, tells us quite a lot about his alignment in American politics, how he understood his role in the American Revolution, and quite a lot about how, after the American Revolution, as ideological politics hotted up, as it does, of course, tremendously, especially in the 1790s, when you have this ferocious battle, ideological struggle between the Federalists and Jeffersonians. Uh, Jefferson, Madison, and his allies, uh, and people like Tom Paine, of course, understood the ideological deadlock, as I suppose it was then, as it has been at certain stages since in American politics, in a particular way. And I think that the way that they understood the deadlock in American ideological politics in the 1790s um, is very closely related to how he interprets, how he understands the French Revolution, and how he looks at particular factions that work within the French Revolution. So it's that that I uh, mainly want to focus on, and uh, we'll try to clarify during my lecture. So, uh, what we see is that he adhered to essentially the same anti-aristocratic republican principles as we saw earlier in his performance in America. During the early rumblings of the French Revolution, uh, he and his friends, so Lafayette, he's quite close to Lafayette at this stage, and uh, La Rochefoucauld, who was a prominent uh, aristocratic member of, but very liberal in his views of the, um, of the States General when it convened in April 1789. Um, at first, in the late, it, it, during the debates of late 1788 and early 1789, uh, Jefferson clearly considered France to be not yet ready to make the kind of transition from monarchy to republicanism, which uh, he and his Americanist uh, friends and, and many of the leaders of the new revolution were ultimately uh, committed to. He, he did, France could not yet wholly dispense with existing, long-standing institutional structures, he felt. They agreed that France should follow America's path eventually, but for the time being could do so only partially and by gradual stages. In the summer of 1788, though, as the pamphlet war in France heated up and radical critique of the privileged orders grew more strident, Jefferson became increasingly impatient and soon disgusted with the conduct and attitudes of the French nobility and the privileged elites, and especially the uh, regional high courts in France, the Parlement. And he realized that these age-old bodies were not just mobilizing popular opinion against the king in their own interest in a certain way, but also misleading uh, popular resistance to the crown in uh, a particularly selfish way, which um, rather disgusted him. Until early 1789, though somewhat too optimistic that younger French nobles at least would finally abandon their privileges and support the reform efforts of the leaders of the Third Estate, uh, Jefferson continued urging his friends to see the wisdom in this very turbulent context of a cautious middle-of-the-road approach. The Estates General should begin tentatively seeking reforms that fell rather short of what had been achieved in America. Uh, but this is because he thought that what was good for America was also good for France, but it couldn't be achieved in France just yet. And he was also worried about the potential, uh, the consequences of a powerful aristocratic backlash. And seeing something like what happened in Holland in the 1780s, you have actually in Europe the first real democratic republican movement, I would say, in Europe was in the 1780s. It was quite strong and almost taken over the uh, institutions, the assemblies of the Dutch Republic by 1787. The monarchies in Europe, including Britain, rem remember in the late 18th century and early 19th century, Britain mostly is following a very, very reactionary role. Britain stands for monarchy and aristocracy, it always opposed democratic movements, and did so very strongly in the Netherlands in 1780s. In fact, there's a behind-the-scenes agreement 
Um, the Prussian monarchy was very hostile to what was happening in Holland and also wanted to suppress the democratic movement, but was afraid to because the French crown in its last years, uh, 1787, attached its prestige to this, promised the, uh, the liberals, the reformers, the democrats in Holland, that we'll support you if there's trouble with Prussia. The king of Prussia's sister was married to the stadtholder and thought she was being insulted by all these democratic tendencies in Holland. So the Prussian monarchy was a little bit worried about intervening there, and the British government behind the scenes intervened and said, don't worry about France, we'll take care of them. The important thing is to suppress democracy. You go ahead and send the Prussian army into Holland. So that's what happened in 1787, and the Dutch democratic movement was uh, suppressed. After what had happened, the humiliations in America, of course, the British crown was in no mood to see Dutch Republic was almost, a, 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 under the House of Orange, under the Princes of Orange, was almost a, was not just an ally, almost a dependency of British power in the world, but they were extremely hostile, the uh, Parliament and the Crown in London, to these democratic developments. Anyway, that was suppressed, and Jefferson was very aware of this and didn't want to see something similar happen in France. So a cautious approach seemed essential. Um, he, he knew already from discussions with his friends that once the Estates General met in April 1789 that the, uh, the reformers would try to make a declaration of rights, like the American Declaration of Rights in, in uh, 1776. And uh, Jefferson wrote to uh, the famous Welsh political thinker Richard Price that uh, they flattered themselves, the reformers he means in the Estates General, uh, that they shall form a better constitution than the English. I think it will be better in some points, he wrote, worse in others. It will be better in the article of representation, which will be more equal. It will be worse as their situation obliges them to keep up the dangerous machine of a standing army. The France can't do that, a standing army. As the months passed, though, Jefferson realized that the conflicting goals and interests of the warring factions were too incompatible and the political struggle too far-reaching and bitter for the third estate to accept any outcome short of wholly demolishing the privileged status of the nobility and clergy. So the nobility and clergy had special rights, special status uh, in the states general, and this, he agreed, had to go. Um, the... This meant that he had come round by, certainly by the spring of 1789, to the view that France would follow America's Republican path more rapidly and more forcefully than he had first judged realistic. Then, of course, the first crisis in the revolution comes in June 1789, when uh, the third estate, uh, are demanding that the special privileges of the nobility and clergy have to go and there can't be any more voting by the states. They, they want, of course, this famous event on the 17th of June 1789 when by a, a large majority the third estate proclaim the states general ended and they say that they're now the National Assembly of the French people and that there's no more no special status and no more special privileges uh, in the voting in the National Assembly for the nobility and the clergy, but the nobility and the clergy don't set, accept this and the French crown finds itself in a jam between the two sides. And uh, at this point, uh, Jefferson wrote that uh, we shall know, I think, within a day or two, he wrote this to Madison uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in late June 1789. He's very excited by these developments. We will know whether the government will risk a bankruptcy and civil war rather than see all distinction of orders done away with, which is what the Commons will push for. The third declaration, 17th of June, as has often been noticed, seized uh, many onlookers by surprise and constituted a stunning revolutionary act in itself. It signified not just rejection of noble and ecclesiastical privilege, but France's, it really meant the end of the whole uh, status oriented system of uh, the whole legal and institutional political structure of France really went by the board at this point. 
Abandoning his earlier skepticism and caution, Jefferson became increasingly enthusiastic. The debates of the States General have been so interesting lately, he, re he, re he wrote to uh, Philadelphia the day after, that's on the 18th of June, as to carry me almost every day to Versailles. Uh, the, the king, being in a jam, shut the deputies out of the assembly building uh, to try to bring them to heel, uh, and the uh, the National Assembly famously reconvened in the nearby Royal Tennis Court and urged on by uh, the, there we are, that's the convening of the French States General in April 1789 and uh, they, of course, reconvened in the, uh, in the Tennis Court and um, as was immortalized later in the, the famous painting by the revolution's greatest artist, Jacques-Louis David, uh, one of the most famous events of the French Revolution is the collective vow of the third in the tennis court, never to separate until the French constitution was recast fundamentally so as to eliminate privilege and separate orders forever. Um, only one of the 577 deputies, so uh, uh, although there were nearly 1,200 deputies in the whole of the States General in April 1789, of course a large proportion were nobles and uh, clergy who were boycotting this episode, and not all the third were there. There were 577 deputies, only one refused to sign. Uh, and it was, of course, a fundamental event of the revolution. Then on the 27th of June, the gathering storm Jefferson so vividly recounted in his reports to Philadelphia suddenly um, calmed, but with the royal court, not the third estate, backing down. This was due less to royal spinelessness than serious unrest destabilizing Paris, which has spread, Jefferson observed, to all the troops except the Swiss soldiers. The French guards began to quit their barracks, to assemble in squads, to declare that they would defend the life of the king, but would not cut the throats of their fellow citizens, leaving onlookers in no doubt on which side they would be in case of a rupture. Jefferson could scarcely contain his excitement. Downcast and humiliated, Louis found himself left with no alternative but to acknowledge the National Assembly, inviting the, uh, the, those sections of the noblesse and of the clergy who had refused to participate up to now to rejoin what was now called, what the king himself now was willing to call the National Assembly. Uh, which, in, in, so in both theory and practice, sovereignty had now effectively been transferred from the crown to the people, just as occurred in the United States in July 1776. The revolution had now Having prostrated the old government, the new constitution should begin. Jefferson was all in favor of that, and it should start with the declaration of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. Uh, Lafayette and Jefferson together drew up, uh, they'd already drawn up one provisional list, they drew up a second, uh, a fresh list of natural rights at this time in 13 articles, going slightly beyond the scheme that they had drafted a few weeks before in early June, and again based broadly on American, the American principles of 1776. So this new draft was considerably shorter and closer to the American model than uh, the um, much more, much longer, more grandiose and elaborate formulations favored by other uh, major figures in the French Revolution, Mirabeau and especially Sears, who drafted an enormously long rival proposed uh, Declaration of Rights of Man, um, and uh, the, much of the debate about the Declaration of Rights of Man through July and August 1789 was uh, uh, an argument about the, the uh, actual phrasing, the formulation, uh, and of course the, the number of articles, the content of the Declaration. Jefferson and Lafayette continued to favor fairly short, uh, short and very uh, concise document that would much more closely resemble the American Declaration than the sort of thing that Mirabeau and uh, Sears were aiming at. Uh, 
collaboration between the different uh, um, Republican, I call them that advisedly, I know Mirabeau is often not regarded as a Republican, but Mirabeau too and Sears are trying to deplete, although they did not want to reject monarchy completely from the Constitution, many of uh, Jefferson's friends, French friends did, like uh, Condorcet and uh, Brissot and many other figures who were either in the, uh, the Paris city government or in the National Assembly at this point. And the two leading figures amongst the reformers in the National Assembly, Mirabeau and Sears, certainly wanted to deplete the French crown, French monarchy, of all real power as far as possible, and vest all actual power, including more or less total control over the finances of the monarchy, in the legislature. So in that sense, I think the whole reforming body were much more strongly Republican in tendency than the historians uh, usually describe the revolution in 1789. 90. That's not to deny that there isn't uh, a very strong monarchical uh, tendency in the National Assembly, and whilst Jefferson is still there, this is, becomes more and more evident during the summer and autumn of 1789, you see a, a growing and very deep split between the monarchia, the moderates, the moderate reformers in the National Assembly, uh, led by people like Mounier and Lali Tolendal, and uh, later Malloy and the Abbe, uh, Abbe Maury, there's a very, very strong faction. I'd say they're even larger uh, and have more support than the more famous and uh, uh, more radical reformers like uh, Mirabeau and uh, Sears. And they say, uh, no, what we want, uh, England have the right idea. The, the real model for an enlightened monarchy uh, should be mixed government. It should be uh, a monarchy that that continues to vest a considerable degree of power and leverage, control of the finances, appointment of ministers, military control should remain in the crown, that um, the, uh, the aristocracy should remain a separate estate and remain very influential in the workings of the monarchy, and uh, Montesquieu is perhaps the political philosopher who most clearly uh, reflects this kind of modern enlightenment thinking. So uh, these, uh, let's call them constitutional monarchists, who are such a powerful force within the French Revolution, right through actually from these early stages until they are eliminated in the uprising of August 1792, uh, they are in a certain sense um, parallel the John Adams, the Hamiltonian dimension, let's say, the federalist tendency within the American Revolution and within American ideological politics in the uh, late 1780s and in the 1790s. S whereas, uh, I think, uh, Mirabeau and Sears, uh, and certainly those who are more uh, avowedly Republican, uh, like uh, amongst Jefferson's own friends, like uh, Condorcet, uh, are, of course, much more clearly aligned with uh, the Jeffersonian tendency within the American Revolution. So, uh, tensions not only remained, but uh, increased uh, after June 1789 through uh, July, in the early parts of July, and the king made things much worse by dif uh, dismissing his uh, reforming minister, Necker, Jacques Necker, and this looked, the dismissal of Necker looked rather like proof of the court's underlying rejectionist attitude and what Jefferson called the French aristocracy's perfidious intentions, as well as those of the, um, uh, the, the, the anti-revolutionary attitude of the high courts of the Parliament. So dismissing Necker provoked an outright confrontation uh, and uh, the National Assembly was certainly in a strong position because there was a lot of support for them in the streets of Paris and in other cities, there's quite a lot of trouble in the war, for instance, in the uh, summer of um, 1789. And uh, the French regiments of the army obviously were sufficiently uh, disturbed by subversive tendencies for the king to be forced to recognize that he couldn't really rely on them. That's the real weakness. Jefferson mentions this several times the king can't can count on his Swiss and German regiments, but in a way that only makes things worse, using foreign troops in Paris and 
He's very aware that the king can only rely on these foreign troops and that this is a tremendous weakness. It's perhaps the greatest weakness in Louis XVI's position during these amazing weeks and months of the summer of 1789. The most disturbing development in this situation, explained Jefferson, again reporting to Philadelphia, was that additional great bodies of troops, and principally of the foreign corps, were approaching the outskirts of Paris from different parts of France. This is just before the 14th of July and the attack on the Bastille. Uh, Jefferson mentions at this point that something like 30,000 men had been brought up. As a result, an already dangerous confrontation escalated. The mobs immediately shut up all the playhouses. This is another quote from Jefferson. Before long, the foreign troops were advanced into the city. Engagements took place between some of them and the people. But the real struggle was just beginning. Serious, there was serious unrest for several days before the 14th of July. Fear and uncertainty was sharpened by food shortages, especially grain shortage. And uh, there was quite a lot of uh, unseemly rioting and some pillaging of shops as well in Rouen, but not, not in Paris, which is interesting. The, uh, despite the, uh, the tension and the turmoil, uh, prominent crowd leaders like uh, Camille Desmoulins and Thé Théophile Mandat, who were both uh, outstanding orators, uh, were delivering rousing speeches in the, uh, in the, the Palais Royal cafes, exhorting the people to action, to defend the revolution, and to make sure the revolution wasn't overwhelmed by reactionary tendencies, but at the same time, pleading with the people. And the leaders of the revolution were quite successful at this. And Jefferson remarks on it several times in saying, but, but yes, what we need is your support. Demonstrations in the streets, collective action, but a disciplined collective action which doesn't degenerate into pillage and attacking shops. And there's very little of that. And throughout these months, as he stood in the midst of the French Revolution, Jefferson is continually irritated by the extremely hostile appraisals of the situation emanating from Britain. Remember the main European newspapers that Americans eventually get hold of and read. And so it's bound to influence their picture of what's happening in uh, France. Though I should emphasize it's a very important part of this whole topic that, um, generally speaking, uh, sentiment in the United States towards the French Revolution was much more positive and much more favorable than it was in England. There is a very, very big difference. In 1789, in 1790, even in 1791, 92, 93, it's not actually till 1796, I would say, that there is a very, there is a significant backlash against the French Revolution in the United States. Sentiment in the United States is much more strongly in favor of the French Revolution than it is in Britain. There is a very, very big difference. And that is something, it's one of the most important things, one of, the, one of those things that historians have failed to bring out very strongly, I think, which is uh, most dominates the whole, uh, the whole position of the uh, way Americans perceived revolutionary movements in Europe, the, the way uh, the, uh, the French Revolution impacts on American politics. It's very, very important to bear that firmly in mind. So Jefferson was continually irritated by the extremely hostile appraisals of the situation emanating from Britain, and in certainly influencing uh, uh, some elite opinion, particularly in, in the government, people like uh, Hamilton and uh, John Adams, of course, are very um, antagonistic towards the French Revolution and its democratic tendency from the beginning. But that is very untypical and uncharacteristic of American opinion more generally. And Jefferson extremely dislikes the way that the English newspaper reports are uh, circulating in America and influencing and being used by certain individuals. Um, <clears throat> And he said he's ready to, he says in one of his letters that he was ready to attest, having observed the mobs with my own eyes, in order to be satisfied on this point, that on the whole, the rioters behaved with uh, commendable restraint and dignity. And that, I think, is a very fair appraisal of the situation as it was in 1789 and 1790. So, 14th of July, the Bastille's fall, um, that... Um, there's Lafayette, there, 
and uh, there is Louis the Sixteenth, who dithered a lot and has often been represented as a rather weak king. I think, to be fair to Louis the Sixteenth, unlike uh, Marie Antoinette and a lot of people in uh, Louis' entourage, um, there was a very human. Uh, quite dignified streak in Louis XVI. He didn't like bloodshed. He didn't want to order his troops to open fire on the crowds. He didn't like killing and shooting large numbers of demonstrators. The prospect of that didn't seem to bother uh, a lot of people around the court. But it did bother him, and I think it played a large part in why the, the, the king plays this, this, this kind of very hesitant and uh, very cautious and, and doesn't doesn't at any stage really try to crack down strongly on, on, on the revolutionaries. Um, the Bastille's fall was intellectually, and even more, I think, psychologically and politically, the most decisive event of the early French Revolution. Royal power and prestige never recovered from the blow. The impact of this throughout France and also Germany, Britain, and eventually the United States, despite the continuing disorder in the French provinces, was uh, overwhelming. Democrats and egalitarians everywhere rejoiced. Richard Price wrote to Jefferson enthusiastically on the 3rd of August, claiming progress and completion of one of the most important revolutions that have ever taken place in the world, a revolution that must astonish Europe, that shakes the foundations of despotic power, and that probably will be the commencement of a general reformation in the governments of the world, which hitherto have been little better than usurpation, usurpations on the rights of mankind, impediments to the progress of human improvement, and contrivances for enabling a few grandees to suppress and enslave the rest of mankind. So there's <laughs> some very um, uh, tremendous rhetoric at this point, but it was, of course, a, a, a crucial, tremendous uh, turning point, no question about that. The, this crucial global um, shift in July 1789 resulted from the uh, conjunction of the American Revolution's radical tendency with this democratic-republican uh, tendency within the French Revolution. So the conjunction of these two things is something that uh, onlookers when, were, uh, by this point, very vividly aware of. So with Edmund Burke utterly appalled, and Price grandly optimistic, and Tom Paine and Jefferson thoroughly exhilarated, uh, the French National Assembly was trapped in this three-way tussle that I've tried to describe, irreconcilably split between an aristocratic right, uh, liberal monarchist, semi-republican Montesquieu center, and a democratic republican radical enlightenment left, with little immediate prospect of resolving such deep-seated ideological contradictions, even without considering France's fourth great, so there are really four great ideological uh, blocks in France, because there's a, a large part of the population, and certainly of the nobility and clergy, remain ultra-royalist ultra and Catholic, uh, they're a Catholic rejectionist cons constituency, which uh, more or less antagonistic to the revolution as a whole. And they remain very powerful throughout France, not just in certain regions like the Long Day, but in every part of France, including Paris. This is a very, very, very strong constituency right the way through the revolution. So after the Bastille's fall, a bitter power struggle develops in the press, the clubs, and the Paris city government, replicating the same uh, Basically, the same split that you saw within the American Revolution, a, a moderate aristocratic revolution versus a, a democratic republican uh, revolution. And this parallelism, parallelism between the early American Revolution and the French Revolution is something, I think, that runs right through the story of the French Revolution until the point where this is something that was not, of course, part of the American Revolution. It changes. In June 1793, when uh, Robespierre and the Montagne, uh, through a coup d'etat, really, gain control of the National Assembly and become the dominant faction with the, within the French Revolution. That, I think, represents a quite different ideological tendency, which I call authoritarian populist. Uh, there are many, many differences between the, uh, although historian, I think this, this is unfortunate usage of words, which is very confusing for students, perhaps, and uh, has tended to 
uh, befuddle the whole discussion to a certain extent is calling the Montagnard and the Montagnard radical. But they're not radical in ideological terms. They're in many ways much more traditional than the democratic republicans, the Brissotins and the people who play such a large part from 1789 through to June 1793 and are at certain stages the dominant faction, particularly between August 1792 and June 1793. But um, it, you only have to look at uh, some of the central policies that they follow to see how different ideologically uh, the Montagna are from the democratic republicans. I mean, take the example of freedom of the press. One of the most important things, of course, about the French Revolution is that from the moment the Bastille falls in July 1789, the press is completely free. So any political position can be openly um, uh, publicized, even ultra-royalists. There are a lot of ultra-royalist newspapers. There are constitutional royalist newspapers. There are Republican, Democratic newspapers. And these populists, uh, usually rather, they're, they're addressed to a less educated segment of the population. Clearly, papers like uh, Marat's uh, L'Ami du Peuple are kind of, um, well, I hate to use the word crass, but they are pretty crass, you know, full of expletives and uh, very highly oversimplified ways of analyzing the political situation. And a bit like what in England today is called the the gutter press, something like that. You know. uh, or terribly exaggerated and very violent, always calling, why aren't we executing? Uh, why aren't we cutting off hundreds and hundreds of heads so that we're not having uh, difficulty anymore with people who, uh, for one reason or another, are targeted by this, this kind of press? Um, so whereas the Democratic Republicans always fight for and defend and say it's one of the most important principles, and of course it's in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, uh, freedom of the press is a fundamental principle for them. Whereas the Montagna made it quite clear, even before they captured power in June 1793, we're not at all interested in freedom of the press. For goodness sake, what we're interested in is the common <coughs> man. Uh, you know, they use a kind of debased Rousseauist logic to say legitimacy lies in ordinariness, which they elevate into a kind of um, <coughs> legitimizing criterion and uh, see the ordinary person as being somehow a collective. It's a way of thinking about the general will as a device or an instrument that you can use to impose an authoritarian system. So, uh, you know, there can only be one right way of thinking because the ordinary person only thinks there's only one correct way of thinking, and so anyone that disagrees with us should be eliminated. Well, why, why would we tolerate other kinds of newspapers? So they, they, even before they captured power, they made it quite clear that they were not going to continue uh, freedom of the press. They were going to eliminate everybody that criticized or uh, disagreed with them. So it's an entirely different kind of ideology, and it's an entirely different kind of uh, political tendency, and its intellectual sources are quite different. But Robespierre is very, very sincerely committed to Rousseau, although the way he understands Rousseau is, I think, somewhat debased and oversimplified. But he's, there's no doubt, I think, that he uh, is very... Um, is very deeply immersed in, in Rousseau's thought, whereas for the rest, the Enlightenment is something he feels antagonistic to. And he often attacks the philosophers and the Enlightenment in his speeches. So uh, that, that third tendency, um, the authoritarian populism of the Montagna, that's something <coughs> which doesn't really enter into the American scene. But they're not an important factor in the French Revolution until 1792. Between 1789, and August 17, uh, and June 1793, well, let's say August 1792, um, you, uh, apart from reactionaries and ultra-royalists <coughs> who reject the revolution entirely, there are two factions that matter. The moderate enlighteners or reformers who uh, admire Montesquieu and want to keep a strong aristocratic as well as monarchical element and don't want democracy, uh, they're also not entirely happy with all this freedom of the press stuff. They'd like to limit that somewhat. And our democratic republicans who uh, 
want to eliminate aristocracy, really, as a, as a, both politically and as a, <coughs> as a uh, dominant segment in society, you want to weaken the role of aristocracy. For instance, in uh, June 1790, one of the most significant measures that's pushed through by the radical reformers is uh, a decree on um, forbidding the use of aristocratic titles in uh, not just in national political business, but even in the municipal politics. So even in uh, the town councils, even when there are de uh, debates and decisions being made, uh, the, the, the whole system of town government was reformed. Uh, by the, everything is reformed, actually, by the radical revolutionaries. When they're dominant, they say, we want to change everything. And they do change everything, even the names of the days of the week. So of course, the processes of town government are no exception. And the decree of June 1790 has it that in conducting municipal politics, you are not allowed to introduce yourself as the Marquis de so-and-so or the Count of so-and-so. That's finished. That's, that cannot, that does not enter into the way in which municipal politics or any other kind of politics in France is conducted from now on. Once the French upheaval sees the attention of the British and American publics, every prominent American statesmen felt obliged continually to compare the American and French revolutions. Inevitably, they drew very diverse conclusions. However, no other founding father, apart from Madison perhaps, was as acutely aware as Jefferson of the deep intertwining of the two revolutions and their striking, this striking parallelism that I've tried to, to bring out. So I'm quoting again from Jefferson, it's impossible to desire better dispositions towards us than prevail in this National Assembly. This he wrote to Madison on the 28th of August, 1789. Our proceedings have been viewed as a model for them on every occasion. And though in the heat of debate, men are generally disposed to contradict every authority urged by, every authority urged by their opponents, Ours has been treated like that of the Bible, open to explanation, but not to question. I think this was true, though only of the guiding Republican and near-Republican leadership, and in no way true, I think, of the centrists, of the uh, uh, monarchia, the, the monarchists. It's true for all the key left-leaning leaders, but not the Assembly's largest factions. So America's example did weigh decisively and more pertinently than the British Constitution, for instance, but only for the outright Republican foes of monarchy, aristocracy, and ecclesiastical authority, the men leading the democratic revolution, and the ones who are uh, Jefferson's particular friends. Now, Jeff, uh, Lafayette's strategy, both in the National Assembly and the Paris city government, where he played an important role as the commander of the National Guard in Paris, his strategy was to unite the leading, he, he believed, Lafayette, I think Jefferson encouraged him in this, was willing to go along with this for a time, but later thought of it as a mistake, uh, that the revolution could only survive and defend itself if there was some way of bridging the moderates, um, the, the democratic republicans. Um, and the difficulty between them, Lafayette assured Jefferson, is uh, the king's veto. He, he saw the arguments in September 1789 about the royal veto as being absolutely central to the uh, disagreement between the moderates and the radicals. Um, some want the veto absolute, others will have no veto, and the only way to unite them is to find some way for a, what was called a suspensive, that is a temporary veto, um, and to um, leave the king with a certain amount of influence with, with a temporary veto. That's what Lafayette was aiming for, a kind of middle position. With the right demanding balance between king and legislature and the Republicans altogether rejecting the royal veto, uh, Lafayette, who until 1791, continued telling his friends, this is interesting, because in America, Lafayette was one of the Frenchmen who had become very enthusiastic about the idea of republicanism. And in the, French, in the early stages of the French Revolution, he tells his allies and friends that I, too, am a republican. Later, he changes. He's quite clearly uh, a man of the center who is siding with the um, 
constitutional monarchist faction uh, through 1791 and 1792 until he's forced to leave France in August 1792. So he changes later. A close observer, I think Jefferson actually, uh, I, I must say, I admire very much the acuteness of his analysis of the uh, factional battles going on in the National Assembly. And uh, he, it, as, in terms of summing up or analyzing the uh, situation of the factions within the National Assembly in English, it doesn't seem to me that anyone else did it as well as Jefferson did. The Assembly explained, writing, for instance, to John Jay on 19th of September 1789, should be thought of as comprising, he says there are four main factions, but it's, it's actually three main factions and one lesser faction. And he dis Jefferson describes them like this, and I think this is absolutely exact. It's beautifully written. Uh, so the French National Assembly, September 1789, four main factions. First, the aristocrats, as he called them. That's the hard right in the assembly. So that's not the ultra royalists, they're, they're, because they don't, they are unwilling to, to be re represented or have anything to do with the National Assembly. The aristocrats, uh, comprising most of the nobility, the bishops and higher clergy, and the representatives of the Parliament, uh, Jefferson said, strove to retain as much monarchy, aristocracy, and ecclesiastical authority as possible. That's absolutely right. Second come the moderates, royalists, desiring. A uh, this is how he expresses it, quoting, uh, desiring a constitution nearly similar to that of England and division of powers according to the ideas of Montesquieu. Absolutely bang on, I think. Third, uh, an offshoot from the uh, centre faction, a group uh, promoting the liberal or Leonist branch of the royal house, uh, who Jefferson took a particular dislike to and describes as a wicked and desperate group. Uh, so that's that's three factions. Finally, the smallest, actually, in terms of numbers, but the most important in terms of a bit, uh, in, in terms of their influence with the press, because the pro-revolution press down to June 1793 is overwhelmingly in favour, dominated by uh, these democratic republicans, and the group who are most able to organise uh, a, re a positive response amongst the uh, demonstrators and uh, uh, the, the, the politically aware in the streets um, are the, um, uh, the republic. This is how Jefferson describes them. So the fourth were the republicans who are willing to let their first magistrate, magistracy, uh, he means the king, be hereditary, but uh, who intend to make that first magistracy very subordinate to the legislature and to have that legislature consist of a single chamber. So uh, I think Jefferson had a, a really accurate uh, working with uh, Lafayette, who's of course trying to influence the, especially the debate about the Declaration of Rights. He's very sympathetic uh, to one particular group, the Republicans, but he also has this very clear uh, grasp of how the factions play out in the French National Assembly. Um, Jefferson's, certainly the second, third, and fourth blocks that he describes in the National Assembly, they, they're all at loggerheads with each other, but they all call themselves patriots. Paradoxically, yet highly significantly, both moderates and radicals in this escalating bitter contest profess to admire the American Revolution. But each emulated the American example differently. Here too, demonstrating how intricately the American and French revolutions were intertwined. One block, the center left, headed in 1791 by, at uh, the later stage then, by Barnard, Bailly, and the de, de la Metz, admired the Federalist achievement in America, their achievement in creating a republic with a strong executive restricted suffrage and firm commitment to property, wealth, and informal aristocracy. So the middle block in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the moderates in the French National Assembly felt uh, and were aware of a very strong affinity with the Federalist bloc uh, in American politics. Where, so it's the American Revolution of Adams, Hamilton, Morris, and Jay 
that the French centralists admired and felt akin to. By contrast, Condorcet, Brissot, Bonneville, uh, of course, from um, uh, by 1792, also Tom Paine, who had gone to Paris and was now uh, also a, a member of the French National Assembly, um, they admired the democratic egalitarian revolution of Franklin, Jefferson, Paine, Madison, and Lafayette. So this is not just a parallelism. What I tried to describe in the course of this lecture is not just a parallelism in terms of structures, but a parallelism, I think, that uh, the leaders of these blocks, both in France and in America, were themselves very acutely aware of and felt, uh, felt this parallelism very strongly. Uh, and I think that's, that's the main point, uh, really, uh, that I've wanted to get across in this lecture. I see it's now gone on 25 past, so I'd better wrap up so that we have uh, some time uh, for discussion. I'll just quickly go through um, there's the, uh, the fall of the Bastille again. So there's, uh, just to show you, uh, Brissot on the left and uh, Condorcet on the right. Um, and then here we have the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Uh, Tom Paine's book, The Rights of Man, of course, extremely divisive uh, in England, uh, divisive in France, and divisive in America. Uh, very divisive in Ireland, by the way, plays quite an important part in the uh, Irish Revolution in 1790. But in all these cases, it's very interesting to see how a text like this, and how a figure like Tom Paine, of course, is one of the greatest publicists the democratic republican <coughs> tendency, very hostile to the traditional British constitution, extremely favorable to the American Revolution, but the American Revolution of that democratic tendency of equality, the American Revolution of the rights of man, not the American, of course, John Adams knows pay, and so did Hamilton, and so did all the Federalists. So this deep, deep division within American ideological politics, which is now being so showing such a strong parallelism with the situation um, in France. And uh, Montesquieu, of course, is the hero of Adams and the hero of the Monarchia and of Meunier and Lally Tolendal. They say, you know, Montesquieu, wasn't he the greatest political thinker of the 18th century? He was certainly the political thinker who was, who was uh, cited most of the, the foreign political commentator who was most often cited during the American debates or, uh, of the period when the Constitution was being finalized in 1787, greatly admired by one block, but strongly criticized. Of course, Jefferson was very interested in critiques of uh, Montesquieu, and we see this at several points also later in his career as an intellectual exercise. He collected this to the Tracy, for instance. Uh, commentaries on critiques, critical uh, appraisals, what was wrong with Montesquieu's eulogizing of the British Constitution, that was something that interested uh, Jefferson a lot. And uh, so let me just uh, finish with this slightly irreverent uh, uh, comment from 1791 on what was going on uh, in French life and French politics and French institutions. What, what actually <laughs> is the revolution about? So, the myths of monarchy and aristocracy are being overthrown. I think uh, Voltaire, here's Voltaire in, in a way replacing Louis XIV. It's not, it's not literally Voltaire's thought as such. Vol it, you, it, during the revolution, there are many parades and celebrations of Voltaire because in a way he was the most famous representative of the Enlightenment. The fact that he was the friend of kings and, and aristocrats, Brissot, for instance, makes comments about that. That was kind of shoved under the carpet because they needed an emblem, someone who was going to represent the Enlightenment as a whole. So a uh, print like this is, is simply showing us that uh, the myths of the past, monarchy and aristocracy are going out and they're being replaced by philosophy, which is a shorthand for, for the Enlightenment. And uh, perhaps at that point I will conclude and uh, hope that I've uh, at least partially persuaded you that uh, contrary to what uh, so many scholars, uh, American and also uh, famous political scientists and thinkers, not least Hannah Arendt, of course, amongst uh, the, the greatest commentators on the revolutions in the late uh, 18th century, have traditionally 
put great emphasis on how utterly different the American Revolution supposedly was from the French Revolution. But I, I, I hope I've at least succeeded in getting you to think again about that. Was the American Revolution really so different from the French Revolution? At least the French Revolution down to June 1793, the point at which the Montagne took over, I propose to you this evening, uh, shows actually a remarkable parallelism with the American Revolution. Thank you very much. conceptualization of what's wrong with the world and, and how to make it better. And, and this seems to be very profound, I think, this split, and to be reflected in different ways, of, uh, quite contrasting ways of understanding the revolution. Yes, please. You said, I think, that uh, Jefferson hated Rousseau. And I'm curious about that, because I, I would like to find some evidence for that, if I can be able to find any. Um, Rousseau, uh, of course, nobody had a, a bigger impact on the intellectual world than Rousseau in the late 18th century. And, and everyone's read Rousseau, and Rousseau is everywhere, and it is discussed <coughs> a tremendous amount. But there are certain key figures who, they, 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 this is so strong, this general tendency, that you can't directly oppose it. But there are certain key figures who practically never mention <laughs> Rousseau. And when they do, it's possible to see their remark. I mean, uh, Condorcet, who was one of Jefferson's friends, for instance, will uh, who's one of the most important political writers, uh, who are, actually, he's much underestimated as a political figure because he largely wrote the world's first democratic constitution, it, it, unless you include Pennsylvania and Vermont, which were the only two American state constitutions which can fairly be called democratic, I think, in 1776. 
So before the February 1793 French democratic constitution that Condorcet wrote, only Pennsylvania, and the Pennsylvania, uh, the, the democratic constitution, of course, was cancelled in 1790. You get, you get uh, a more restricted suffrage again. So for, I guess Vermont, which was briefly not part of the United States, but an independent sovereignty, could claim to be the first uh, Western democratic re republican uh, sovereignty in the world. But with the exception of Vermont, let's put it that way, <laughs> um, I think the French can say that they had the first, the world's first democratic constitution, which was, of course, uh, amended by the Montagna. Uh, but it, it was, there was a referendum. It was supposed to be implemented and then Robespierre suspended it after three months. So it was not just theoretical, it was actually introduced and then suspended. Um, so uh, Condorcet net, I mean, there virtually never mentions Rousseau. When he does, I think you will see that he really doesn't like Rousseau. And I, I see something rather similar to this in, uh, the references to Rousseau and Jefferson are extremely rare. And when they occur, they're not very, they're not very flattering. Yeah, I mean, there, there could be different reasons or not mentioning people. Yes. Um, yes. So that's why I was wondering. But in the case of Rousseau, it te tends to not to be a sign of enthusiasm when <laughs> you never mention him. And uh, I won't make the same point about not I think, in, in, uh, in Jefferson. Yes, please. I suppose this is the subject of an entirely other lecture, but um, in light of Jefferson's career following his return from France until his election as president, um, to what degree do you think, um, given his, his position as an apologist for even the terror at some point, um, to what degree do you think his opinions uh, of the revolution were seen through, not rose-colored glasses, but Francophile glasses, given his great love for French culture and his uh, antipathy towards British yeah. uh, systems? I think... Um Enthusiasm for England was so strong in Federalist circles by the middle of the 1790s uh, that, that, that um, Jefferson's Francophilia was seen almost as a kind of ideological emblem in America. That, that's quite true. But I, I think one uh, should hesitate before accusing Jefferson of oversimplifying. I don't think anyone can question his real commitment and enthusiasm for the French Revolution, but the, his friends were these uh, democratic republicans, these Britons. He, in, in 1793, when, of course, he wasn't expecting to be called back in October 1789, and I suspect, I don't know whether there's any proof of this, that Washington brought him back because he thought he was being too, too pro-French and too involved in the revolution. But, um, by uh, late 1792 and early 1793, um, his secretary, who is the acting ambassador in Paris, William Short, starts, who, who has very similar views to Jefferson down to 1792 about the revolution and about American politics as well, starts writing these extremely negative uh, uh, comments about the this new group who are coming to the fore, the, the Montagna. And, and Jefferson t reprimands him several times, saying that I'm having enough trouble trying to get the Washington cabinet to be a bit more you know, uh, reasonable about France. And, and then you're sending these very negative reports about this, this, this group. But I think that was because Short was much more able to see what was happening than Jefferson was uh, in that crucial period. And later, uh, Jefferson is very negative in his relatively few comments about Robespierre, but he recognizes that the terror was a terrible thing, that Robespierre was a dictator. He's not saying anything uh, positive. I don't think any enlightener ever said anything positive about Robespierre. I think it's a very strange thing that so many historians take a, a relatively benign view. They say, well, you know, chopping off all those heads is not great, but when you take everything into account, there's quite a lot to be said for Robespierre. I find that very strange because every, every enlightener um, whether they're American, British, French, German, or Swedish, as the, in the case of Thomas Torrell, who was terribly enthusiastic about the revolution. And one of the last, he, he, he was very reluctant to agree that the Montagna were ruining everything. And that, but uh, as he, he, when he finally went public and made an announcement about this, he said, it's true, Robespierre is an all-consuming crocodile. But he was very reluctant to, to come to that point. And I think, um, but every enlightener, realized that this was a, an anti-intellectual uh, 
uh, an anti-enlightenment uh, kind of a form of counter-enlightenment that with which they couldn't have any any sympathy and that uh, that goes for Jefferson too I mean if, when you look at his later correspondence he's, he quite clearly differentiates between the revolution French Revolution of his friends and the French Revolution of those people which you can't uh, you, 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 you can't condone and I don't think he does and uh, if you and he, he relations with short uh, become much better again later. And if you look at the exchange, for instance, when um, in the, uh, um, is it at the end of the 1790s, I forget exactly when, uh, Condorcet is, is again acknowledged as a great hero in France and the statue is put up to him in Paris and they congratulate Short and, and Jefferson exchanged letters saying how great this is and how terribly the Mont Montagne treated him and so on. So, no, I, I think that uh, Jefferson was very reluctant to say that things had gone wrong with the French Revolution, but he uh, he compares Robespierre to Napoleon as a dictator who it's impossible to have any sympathy for in his later correspondence, and and he's pretty negative about Napoleon and and Robespierre. I'd say. Yes, please. Uh, so the dismissal of Jack Necker is is often considered a, a catalyzing event that in many ways augments a lot of the trends building up to the uh, storming of the Bastille. And I was just wondering, um, how did Jefferson analyze the, the Necker dismissal and, and sort of what were his thoughts on that? Uh, he's not, uh, I don't know whether he actually says much by way of analyzing the dismissal. Uh, he's a bit puzzled by this because it doesn't seem to strengthen the king's position particularly. I think historians also have been puzzled since because it didn't, see, it doesn't, in retrospect, it doesn't look like a particularly good idea. <laughs> because the king was, was in a bit of a mess and, and Necker was more likely to help get him out of it than any other reforming minister. And it, it just made it look as if the king had opted for the reactionary circles around him. Uh, so Jefferson responds in that way, really, saying that, uh, that, that he, 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 he has no sympathy for this. His sympathies obviously lie very much with, with, with the revolution. Um, and he, he, he can't see any sense of it. And I think that, that has been the case. It doesn't seem terribly sensible in retrospect. Yes, please. So I've been reading poems published in Boston during the early national period. Poems? Yes, yeah. published in Boston during the early national period. And <coughs> on the same page of the Massachusetts Magazine in March of 1793, there's a poem celebrating George Washington and a poem celebrating Marie Antoinette. So we're right between the execution of Louis and Marie Antoinette's execution. And I was surprised by the poems about Marie Antoinette, but maybe I shouldn't be. Maybe these are both expressions of a kind of federalist sensibility. My question is, did that sympathy go all the way to Marie Antoinette? Um, well, that's new to me. I, I haven't <laughs> heard this linkage before. That's curious. Um, it's but, an extraordinary poem, I'm sure it's the evidence seems to suggest, although, of course, various groups, not only uh, big landed aristocrats, supported the, the Federalists, other groups did as well. But the, the, most of the evidence, as far as I can see, strongly suggests that in sharp contrast to England and the whole of Europe out, outside of France, most people, even, and I think this is the, the French Revolution is the only foreign event which everyone seems to be following, even on the farms of Kentucky, that the entire American population were really interested in this. This seemed important, and, it see, and, and I think people felt and understood how closely it was related to the American experience. And the vast majority of the public, I think, were very sympathetic to the French Revolution until, uh, I, I don't think, uh, some historians think that there's a significant change around with the Genet business around 1793 and so on. It doesn't seem to me that there's really a general reaction against the French Revolution until the late 1790s. From about 1796, some of, and the change comes about partly because there seems to be um, the, the publishing leading uh, Protestant clergy, uh, loads of sermons, of course, uh, an amazing number, extremely um, favorable towards the French Revolution, still in 1795. The terror itself doesn't seem to have changed it position that much as far as I can see. But, uh, but even some of the same, very same people who uh, are saying very positive things about the French 
revolution as recently as 1795. By 1796, the seven had changed to, um, and they were, uh, especially amongst the um, Presbyterian and other Protestant clergy who uh, would be very influential, of course, at that time, uh, seemed to change their position and switch to a pro-federalist stance. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of opinion um, uh, switches to a pro-federalist position, uh, especially in relation to what's going on in France in, in the later 1790s. So that's a, that is a very important change. And American um, opinion seems to be very divided <coughs> over the French Revolution in the late 1790s in a way that it, it really isn't in the early and middle 1790s. And I think that that is an interesting phenomenon. I have a question about the role of Edmund Burke in yes. this history, because um, this, in a way his analysis of the French Revolution is parallels in a certain extent um, to Rome own with the importance of ideas and um, the, the role of the philosopher, of course, I mean, his is a sort of caricatured version with the, yeah. the, the, the philosopher, sort of cabal of Nicolato, who was sort of, um, um, infusing these abstract ideas around them. And, and that's what's sending everything uh, um, off course from the, the realm of nature. Yes. But what's interesting is that he likes the American Revolution. Yeah. And so I'm wondering what. Um, well, well there's, that has actually some recent analysis have rather challenged this okay. idea. Yeah, right. I wasn't, uh, because um, it's true that Burke has usually been read as being quite favorable to the American position. But actually, when you examine it closely, what he. His real stance on the American Revolution is that he thinks the British government and Crown are being really stupid and fighting a war that doesn't make any sense, in which they're probably going to lose, which will be very expensive, and it's hard to see how they're going to get any, derive any benefit from it. He thinks the whole way that the American crisis is handled was very poor on the part of the British government. But it's a bit of a jump from that to assume, therefore, he's sympathetic to. Um, I don't. I, I, it seems not only in relation to the American Revolution, but also in relation to the Dutch crisis in 1787, where he's also not at all sympathetic towards the Democrats. I, I don't think Burke ever likes uh, democratic republican positions. What he likes is the British mixed government notion, with the, in effect, with the aristocracy running the country. The British have the right. Yeah, <laughs> Mounier thought the same. The aristocracy should be running the country, oh, which is, after all, more or less what the Federalists thought as well. And the, uh, John Adams quite clearly thought that the aristocracy, or in American terms, the informal aristocracy, should run the country. That's a large part of the, the battle in the 1790s. Uh, and I think that's that's exactly what Burke thought too. So I, I, he he may have uh, he may have had a certain sympathy for, let's say, the John Adamses, or a particular way of interpreting. But I very much doubt whether he had any time for uh, Jefferson's views at any right. stage. No, I was wondering how the parallelism between yeah. the revolutions would, how he would, his, his argument would actually. It, it's true, it though, that the, for instance, in the relationship between Tom Paine and Burke, it's much less antagonistic before 1790, let's say, than it is later. Uh, that's certainly true. So the, I, but I think the incipient rifts and divisions are there, which become much more clear and more emphatic uh, after 1790. Yes, please. Um, you made a very uh, persuasive uh, and compelling case for the affinities between the American and the French Revolution and the parallelism, which you said it's really more than just parallelism. Um, I wonder how the French historians of the French Revolution especially in the past decade or so, um, have viewed uh, the same problem and how much awareness of this parallelism and affinity there is. Uh, if you were to speak as a French historian yeah. of the French Revolution. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, there are a lot of French historians and a lot of divisions among them, so it's very difficult to generalize. And some of the uh, younger French scholars uh, think about these things very differently uh, many of the older and more established colleagues. Uh, but in general, of course, there has a, a peculiarity of the French system is that intellectual history or uh, tends to be um, more history of philosophy and more attached to philosophy departments. And history departments in French universities generally, uh, in contrast to Britain and America, lack intellectual history. So a peculiarity of a large proportion 
I don't know whether you agree with this, I know French history is your domain, but it seems to me that a, a very large part of French Revolution historiography uh, has kind of steered away from the intellectual history of the revolution. It's, trying, it's looking all the time for the social and cultural causes, which are supposedly more important. I think that social factors are very important, but they're often doing different things from <laughs> shaping the legislation or the factional battles in the French Revolution. Uh, you, uh, they they put, must play a large part in the story, of course. But if what you're looking at is which uh, the differences between the political factions and the kind of legislation and decisions that they're producing, then I think, in my opinion at least, you've got to give the intellectual history the main emphasis which puts me in a, a, a bit of a minority, and so I've been getting into a lot of fights, as perhaps you've noticed uh, recently, both with uh, American and, and with French uh, colleagues. Well, that's funny. But uh, I, I think that, um, that there isn't, uh, take Fauré, for instance, who tended rather to emphasize the supposed unity of the revolution. So he saw the terror, uh, in a sense, as a culmination of tendencies that are already there in 1789, which doesn't seem to me at all to be the case. So my analysis, which is basically a French revolution, which uh, comprises three revolutions, three different revolutions, which are all fighting each other and completely incompatible and irreconcilable, would not be a position I think most of the, uh, at least up to now, most of the French colleagues would be particularly sympathetic to. So, um, uh, so there are a lot of arguments and discussion that lies ahead, no doubt. But uh, we'll see what comes up. Yes, please. Um, just wondering, given the similarities you mentioned between the French and the American revolutions, where do you think the main differences are that caused the reign of terror and stuff that came afterwards? Well, as I say, this, this third block don't uh, have a parallel, really, in the American context of the Montagna. They did capture power through um, uh, a coup d'etat in June 1793. Even before the terror in the sense of uh, arresting large numbers of people, throwing them in prison, uh, show trials and executions start, and all that stuff doesn't really begin until September, October 1793. But from the beginning, they made it clear now this is a, a very big change. We've no sympathy whatever with what the previous factions were doing. Uh, with, we're shutting down all the newspapers because all that stuff about free speech means nothing to us, uh, and we're going to handle things very differently. So the, 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 the tone, the atmosphere completely changed. Uh, and some of the uh, Brissa towns were outlawed, like Condorcet, who had to go into hiding. Others were arrested and thrown in prison at quite an early stage. Uh, it wasn't clear, of course, that they were going to be tried for their lives and then guillotined. That, that only emerged clearly in the autumn of 1793. But the, 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 uh, there'd been a sea change in the revolution. And its character completely been transformed, I think, was obvious by June, July 1793. So that is, then, then you're in a whole different ballgame. Everything is different after that. And everyone who had been involved in the, in the revolution between 1789 and June 1793 is, it, without any exception really, or all the leading figures are either, uh, they're either they've either fled, fled abroad, <laughs> they're in prison, they're in hiding, like Condorcet, or, or, uh, or they're so discredited that no one pays any attention to them anymore. Uh, with practically no exception. Okay. So, do you think like, I think we support I think we have to end yeah. because oh, we we're expected to sit somewhere. Thanks for your question. Thank you very much. Thank you.